Good morning from Washington, D.C. It's 8 a.m. Uh, my name is, is Anwar uh, Bukharis, and I am a professor of counterterrorism um, and countering violent extremism at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. And I want to extend a very uh, warm welcome to the many Africa Center alumni, distinguished colleagues and friends who have joined us today for this webinar on assessing Jamaat Nasr al-Islam wal Muslimin coalition in the Sahel. I also want to wish uh, our Muslim colleagues a very happy and peaceful Ramadan. So Ramadan Mubarak uh, and Ramadan Karim. Now I would like to pass it over to our interim director, Dan Hampton, to say a few words about the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Buhars. And good afternoon or good morning, depending on uh, where you're connecting from today. And I just wanna say thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and for your interest in this program that we will conduct. As Dr. Buhars mentioned, my name is Daniel Hampton. I'm the deputy director, but currently the acting director for the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. I know we have many alumni with us today who, who know the center. Uh, but we also have some, uh, some new colleagues joining us. And just as a refresher, a little bit about the Africa Center. So the Africa Center was established uh, 23 years ago uh, by our Congress in 1999 for the study of security issues related to Africa and serving as a forum for research, communication, and exchange of ideas. And to achieve this mandate from our Congress, uh, we've developed the following mission statement to advance African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. And within the Africa Center, we're organized around three pillars to execute this mission. The first is our academic affairs section, which organizes seminars, workshops, and events such as this one you're participating in today. Second is our research and strategic communications department. Uh, if you're not familiar with our website, I'd strongly encourage you to check it out. It's africacenter.org. <clears throat> we post all our publications there, free to download in PDF, uh, in English, French, uh, some in Portuguese, some in Arabic. Uh, use it as a resource. It, it's there for you. And uh, our Publications, our spotlights are posted, our infographics, so it's, it's a wealth of information, africacenter.org. And our third pillar is our community alumni affairs section. And that's really about building and sustaining those enduring partnerships that I spoke about in our mission statement. Uh, we realize just connecting for a short webinar like this, or if we do the longer programs, it's still not enough. It's not just one touch point. We wanna stay connected with you, be a resource for you. We want the Africa Center uh, to be mutually beneficial between us and you. And the last part of the mission statement I mentioned about catalyzing strategic solutions, and that's where you come in, where hopefully the information that you receive today will be helpful to you in your job and in your position, that you can use this information to better inform you as you do your job. Uh, this is an important program. Uh, better understanding the VEOs and the complexity I think oftentimes there's a, it's too quick to come up with a simplistic definition or approach to some of these groups. And it clearly, as we know, it's not that case. And I think as you'll see this morning, as Dr. Buhars and our distinguished panelists dive into this a little deeper, when we look at this one specific uh, organization and, and, and grouping of uh, organizations uh, under, this, uh, under this, uh, uh, this organization we'll look at today. So again, thanks so much for being with us and taking your time. And I'm excited about what we have in front of us. So uh, Dr. Buhar, it's back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Hampton. Uh, now let's begin our session on assessing Jamaat uh, Nasr islam or muslimin coalition in, in the Sahel. And we have three distinguished panelists I mean, that will help us explore you know, the origins, aims, and the drivers I mean, of this Al-Qaeda-affiliated uh, coalition. The analysis will consider dynamics in the group's composition, its objectives over time, as well as the political and the economic factors that have enabled you know, this, this coalition to persist. 
Uh, as you all know, uh, the last three years, unfortunately, have seen an escalation in violence and mass killings I mean, of civilians and soldiers in Burkina Faso, Mali, and, and Niger. I mean, the levels of violence have, uh, to be sure, varied across and within countries as discrete and changing conflict environments shape the violent strategies and targeting patterns of armed, uh, of armed actors. Yet the trajectory of this downward spiral of violence is almost the same. We have seen rising communal tensions around land and natural resources, often triggered by socioeconomic changes, by environmental degradations, as well as a crisis of state legitimacy. All of this have created conditions that are conducive to the emergence and to the proliferation of armed groups. So Jamaat uh, Nusrat al-Islam wal Muslimin, which is a coalition, as you will see, of four uh, violent extremist groups, you know, and the so-called Islamic State in the Greater Sahara, they are, for example, shrewdly exploited, you know, inter and intra-communal rivalries over resources, over rights, as well as rising frustrations with governments perceived misrule to expand, you know, their to be to expand their influence across communal lines. Uh, but despite the dramatic escalation of violence, despite the dramatic escalation of terrorism, you know, surprisingly little is still known about how the dominant violent extremist groups in the Sahel are governed, how they make political decisions, how they use violence, and how they respond, you know, to their constituencies. And we believe that without an accurate understanding, you know, of these groups membership structure, their earnings, their spending, strategies, and priorities. I mean, the efforts of states, regional authorities, as well as international actors are not likely to succeed. That's why we're having this webinar today. The webinar will help facilitate this process of starting to understand and to diagnose, you know, violent extremism uh, in, in the Sahel, Central Sahel. Uh, our panelists will provide an in-depth understanding of the major characteristics of one group today, and, and we will have other panels to cover uh, the so-called Islamic State of Greater Sahara and, and other groups. So they will provide in-depth understanding of the major characteristics of this group, as well as the political and economic factors that have enabled it to, <clears throat> to, uh, to persist. Uh, so we have with us uh, <clears throat> uh, Ambassador uh, Kamisa Kamara. Uh, she's a senior visiting expert for the Sahel at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, she's a sub-Saharan <clears throat> uh, well-known uh, Africa policy analyst, a practitioner with 15 years of professional experience. And she has served as, as most of you know, as Mali's uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, she was Minister of Digital Economy and Planning, and most recently she was the Chief of Staff um, to the former president of Mali. And previous uh, to that, she served as senior foreign policy advisor uh, to the president. Prior to working with the Malian government, uh, Kamara held leadership position in Washington, D.C. with the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, the National Endowment for Democracy, and uh, Partners uh, Global. So welcome, Ambassador. Um, and then we have Mr. Uh, Rida Liamouri, Again, uh, he's a, uh, a prominent window figure uh, uh, expert on, on, on the Sahel. He's a senior fellow at the Policy Center for the New South um, and a senior Sahel advisor at the Navanti Group. His research activities focus on geopolitics and international relations in West Africa Sahel, a region he has worked on for about a, a decade. And he has extensive experience in that, supporting both governmental and non-governmental organizations. Uh, in the areas of international aid, development, and, and security, and he has contributed to numerous in-depth research and analysis reports, aiming at building deeper understanding of regional and domestic challenges, uh, particularly the problem of, of violent uh, extremism. And he's often solicited by various stakeholders to provide policy recommendations on how to address these challenges. 
Uh, and finally, uh, we have Mr. Henny uh, Sevilla. He's the, again, well-known <laughs> uh, uh, expert. He's the director of, uh, of MetaStream. He's a risk consultancy providing intelligence analysis and bespoke services. He's also a senior researcher at the Armed Conflict uh, Location Event Data Project, ACRE, where his work is focused on political violence in Sahel, including the collection and analysis of conflict data. Uh, and his research interests center around insurgencies uh, and their various dimensions, particularly social insurgencies and inter-armed group relations in Sahelian countries. Um, and in addition to his research, uh, Saibi has consulted a wide range of organizations on issues of religious security in Sahel and, and North Africa. Uh, he has authored, again, several uh, publications, the most recent of which is uh, The Islamic State in Africa, uh, the emergence, evolution, and future of the next jihadist uh, battlefront, which uh, which really I recommend to uh, uh, to all of you, those that haven't uh, had a chance to, to read the, the book yet. Okay, well, uh, let let's start, and I will start with uh, with Rida. Uh, Rida, Jamaat uh, Nasr uh, Nasr al Islam wal wal Muslimin is a coalition of four. Uh, violent extremist groups that was formed in 2017. It's a Qaeda affiliate, uh, even if it's most of, of constituent elements that are under my command. It's the largest uh, uh, violent extremist uh, organization force in the central Sahel. It was initially based in, in northern and central Mali, and it has expanded into southern and western Mali, then into neighboring Burkina Faso and, and western Niger. The coalition has also stage attacks in, in, in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, northern Cote d'Ivoire and in Benin, uh, which signals its intention to, uh, um, to expand into the coastal areas and to encroach in the Gulf of, of Guinea countries. So, so Reda, I mean, based on, on the extensive research that you have done, you've been on the ground, can you talk us through uh, JNIMs and origins and its aims and, and the drivers of, of this coalition? Reda? Thanks, Anwar. Uh, good morning uh, to everyone and good afternoon to this. Uh, well, it's already in the af in afternoon for them. Um, yeah, thanks, Anwar. Um, you asked very good questions and I think it's always good to start with questions. Even if we don't have the answers, I think it's good to, to, to ask the right questions. Uh, GNM is the result of the transformation of AQIM. So since AQIM was founded in 2006-2007, uh, we have to know that the tactics and the, the strategy that are used is establishing local brigades in northern Mali after it was pushed out of Algeria, started establishing those local brigades led by local leaders, uh, which was strategic so they could, they could have some influence on local communities, they, they could resonate better, narrative resonates better, and they have done that in Kedal region, Timbuktu, in Gao, and then continue to do that even going forward all the way to 2015 by, by moving further to central Mali, by recruiting also Hamadou Koufa, who is a Fulani, on, to establish and to expand to central Mali. And they continue to rely on the same strategy even in Niger, as well as in Burkina Faso with the creation of Asar Islam. Uh, so we can see that this has been a consistent strategy. Um, and also they have continued to be transformed and adapt to what's happening on the ground with, the, as, as we have noticed, despite the, the, the emergence of, an, of um, the Tuareg rebellion in 2012 that demanded the independence, jihadist groups affiliated to Al-Qaeda managed to survive that the 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 occupation of uh, survived the, the rebellion and survived later on the, the arrival of the French forces and continue to transform and that it, the message that we can receive from that is they they we 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 tend to under to underestimate their strategy in the long term. This did not happen by by luck or by chance. They have they, that they continue to exist decade later after almost a decade after the French intervention. Uh, so while we did, they have presence in Northern Mali, they have 
already been working on establishing brigades in central Mali. They have, and while they established presence in central Mali, they, they already started working on establishing local brigades in northern Cote d'Ivoire or in South Mali on the borders with, with, uh, with Cote d'Ivoire. Same thing as we have seen now also in northern Benin or in northern Ghana. So, so you can see that they have always, they, they, they think ahead and we, I think we, we we made the mistake of underestimating how uh, how they plan. Um, in terms of the leadership, I think this, other than the key leaders that that are real well known, Ayad Ghali, Hamad Kufa, um, there is not much known about other key leaders. The, 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 most of the leaders are local commanders that are selected strategically, as I mentioned, and they are even that French forces managed to eliminate few of them. JNM didn't show a sign of, of a sitbacks. They continue to, the new leaders, new local commanders continue to emerge. And that helped them to continue to exist and continue to evolve um, and expand. Their, their objectives, um, it's clear, they, the ultimate object, uh, objectives, they, as they state, is to establish um, uh, an Islamic Khalifat in, in, in Mali, or at least they want a state that is governed and also influenced and based on, um, on the basis of Sharia law. Uh, so that's, that's their ultimate goal, as they state. Um, when it comes to drivers, I think we have and anyone who has research, been researching or working on on, the, on violence extremism in general. I think the obvious drivers um, they are limited, and we can't say that is one more obvious than the other one. We all still we all cited education, economic interest, uh, ideology, but something that struck me and that I, that I have noticed and especially in the Sahel region in recent years, I think two and we consider them like maybe one of them is the elephant in the room is the role of the state. Um, you know, often ask the question of like how you counter the rise of violence extremism, but, but I think the question we need to start asking ourselves is how to create an environment, how the state and the legitimate authorities can create an environment that would not allow these extremist organizations to exist. Well, I think the, 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 the role of the state has been falling short. It created that space for them to continue, as you mentioned, the, the, the question about legitimacy, uh, which became increasingly difficult for them to reestablish. And as you mentioned also, in the, the other point, other than the state, is also the ethnic dimension that the, 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 cri the crisis, the conflict took. And that's why it became really, um, it became uh, violent and we have seen unprecedented level of, of, uh, of violence. Um, historically, the region have been, had issues, economic issues, have ethnic tensions, had issues with governance but we have never seen this level of violence. So I think another question to ask, like why this level of violence now? Um, and I think one of the reasons is this ethnic dimension that the conflict took. And not necessarily also, we can't say when we talk about drivers, we can't say um, that these groups are, they, they don't discriminate when they recruit. And that brings me to the point as you made to, to the recruitment, they don't discriminate. Um, of course, they exploit some, some of these differences and some of these grievances um, towards, um, towards the state by certain ethnic groups. And we have seen, um, as we, we all have heard of the past week of, of, of what happened in central Mali, well, I think the lesson that we can take from that is jihadist groups were occupying that territory um, and the local population, not all of them left. So they have to negotiate their existence with jihadist groups. So they can continue to survive, they can continue to, to practice their livelihoods, they can continue their life as normal as it could be. So they, they accepted because they were abandoned by, by the state. There is no presence of the state there, uh, including security forces. And I have mentioned this before, the return of the state was always gonna be problematic and it was also gonna be catastrophic as we have seen. Because now as the state tries to return and the return of course, the first return is through security forces, 
they are going to look at this population that they have been living under the occupation of jihadist groups. They have been, they are going to be looking at them as collaborators and as supporters of jihadist groups. So it's and this this is this happened last week, and I am afraid this is not the first and this is not last. So it's we are going to continue this this problem. Um, also, the point of, of recruitment, we, we tend to focus on, we continue to say youth. Uh, you, uh, first of all, I think the def definition of youth is very, it, it's vague. And then when we, we think that only youth are the, the main or the core of, of the existence of, of GNM, I think it's, it's misleading because we also have to look at, well, who influences this youth? You know, we have to also look at the elders. The elders have some influence also on, on, on the youth. Women have influence on, on the youth. The role of women, it, while it's still unclear on, in, in recruitment and the support of jihadist groups, but there, there has been a few research that stated um, they, they have roles of providing information, logistics, uh, et cetera. And JNM has done a very good job on keeping the role of women very um, secretive, very tight, like uh, among like very trusted network. Unlike in Boko Haram, where, where, for example, they have kidnapped and they forced marriages, but JNM, they marry a, a, among, among themselves, among the network that they know, among women that they, they trust and families that they trust for security reasons as well, because they don't want, they, they, they want to, to get affiliated with families that are going to uh, to to not give them give them away now to 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 give information um, and, and as I mentioned, my research talked about how they are based in in hamlets and villages nearby, while the the, the husbands, uh, fathers, brothers are based in in the, in the bushes. So. So the, the, the role of women and elders cannot also be undermined and cannot take, be taken lightly. Uh, I, I will stop here and I will, for the matter of time and uh, looking forward to, to your questions. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Reda. I guess you, you delved into the second question about the membership structure as, as, as well, but, but you're absolutely right, J and I am. You know, it pursues, you know, the, the, the two main goals. First, they claim they want the withdrawal of foreign troops. And then what you talked about, the establishment of, uh, of, uh, of Islamic rule, whatever that means, obviously, primarily in, in Mali and potentially in the entire <coughs> Sahel. So, and, and here, by Islamic rule, what they mean is they want to bring the political system as well as the social practices in line with, with their own stringent interpretation of, <coughs> of Islamic law or Sharia. You also addressed how do they go about achieving their their goals, uh, and they rely on, on on several policies. You're right. I mean, they want to spread over the largest possible geographical area as possible. Uh, they uh, they also want to to exhaust uh, the army and the security forces by continually attacking them, and also they try to to gain you know popular uh, uh, support. And how they impose their rules is they is through what you touched on. Obviously, there is coercion, but also uh, uh, persuasion uh, as well. Touched also on the role of women and, and youth, and how they play complex and, and nuanced roles in in, uh, in in this group and in violent extremism broadly in Mali and, and, and Niger because they represent you know strategic human resources for 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 these groups. So we need to address. Uh, women and also youth association with these groups. And to do that, we need to understand, you know, how and, and why they are recruited and, and their reasons, right, for joining, as, as you said, uh, Reda. So I don't know whether you want to add anything on the membership structure of the JNIM, uh, uh, even if, if I believe, I mean, I think you have addressed most of it, right, Reda? <clears throat> Yeah, I, I, as I mentioned, I, I think the group does not discriminate, and and we, we you look at the group it has members from all different backgrounds. Um, we, we you have as you mentioned the four the four 
uh, brigades that formed the co that formed the coalition of JNM. You look at them. You have Ansar Din, which was predominantly Tuareg. Then you have Al uh, Al Morabiton, which is predominantly also like Arabs of, of northern Mali. You have Al Furqan also, who who also were predominantly um, uh, Arabs, Barabish on the borders with uh, with Mauritania. And also you have then the Messina Brigade of Central Mali, predominantly Fulani. And so the, the, the structure, and it, it's, it's misleading to say that GNM is predominantly or it, it does discriminate, it does not. And we can't say that they don't have Bambara members, they don't have Dogon members in their, in their membership. Uh, instead, they have um, made efforts in recent, recent years, recent months to to include and recruit among Doga and, and other um, other minor members who are considered like minority in their in their uh, group. So so the structure is a combination of of all different backgrounds. And as I mentioned, they use that strategically so, do, so that their narrative resonates better with the local communities and areas where they want to expand. Okay, thank you, uh, Reza. I'll go now to <clears throat> to. Um... To, to, to Henny, uh, and I would like you to address some of the key facets of GNIM's uh, <clears throat> war economy and income uh, generation. And uh, through your, your research, I mean, if you can document, you know, the multifaceted means by which this group generates funds, because not, as you wrote about it, <clears throat> uh, uh, Henny, notwithstanding the religious and ideological beliefs that these extremist groups claim to, uh, to uphold, uh, and which in theory should force them to restrain from participating in, in certain activities, what we have seen is that they are generally driven by, by opportunism and, and, and pragmatism when it comes to how they raise funds. Because the goal, after all, is, is how do they take care of, of their troops, right? And how do they maintain their operational capabilities and their, and their influence? And the ISS has done extensive research on, uh, on this. Uh, we at the Africa Center, we just published a piece on, on this particular uh, relationship. But you have done extensive research. So, Henny, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, and for joining this panel, uh, and thank you for the audience for Pleasure. attending and listening to us today, and also to Rida for a great introduction and setting the tone of uh, this panel. So I'm going to continue speaking about Janine's uh, economic activities, and in the more broader sense, uh, the war economy, how they sustain the insurgency, and as you said, the key facets, which are the key components of this war economy. And I'm just gonna go through them quite systematically just to provide this overall picture. Uh, and to begin with, to go back to the origins and when militants in Algeria in the early 2000s made what often is re referred to as the sudden turn by moving into the Sahel and creating a rear base. They also developed this multi-million dollar kidnapping industry. So this was the beginning of the entrance into the Sahel, initially in Niger and also in Mali. And this kidnapping industry focused on foreigners, foreign nationals, Westerners, which generated high yield, revenue for these groups to support their operations in Algeria and in the Maghreb in, in general. Uh, however, today it is still very, it has still high actuality. They still uh, kidnap uh, Westerners and foreigners in the Sahel. Only since 2015, uh, there's been more than 30 abductions of foreigners in the region and you know, the estimated income from all these uh, abductions is between somewhere between 150 million euro up to 200 million euro over the past two decades. At the same time, these kidnapping operations doesn't sustain the, act, the daily activities of the group. It does yield, you know, high revenue, but they also involve very long processes. Uh, 
uh, a lot of risk moving you know hostages to secure locations caretaking and so on but instead we have seen this skyrocketing skyrocketing increase of abductions of local nationals it doesn't generate the same level or amount of money but given the scale like for instance since early 2021 we've seen i mean hundreds of people being kidnapped in the region and while the the sums or the ransom payments are not comparable to the ones uh, for foreigners combined they generate a lot of money and it's also a means to intimidate communities just beyond the kidnapping for ransom kind of aspect so that is one key facet of jailing's war economy it's kidnapping operations and then you also have zakat or taxation which is also very important uh, the taxation or zakat you know, it's it yields a lot. Of, it yields a lot of money, and especially since these groups uh, control or exert influence over vast territories. And it also, you know, zakat is one of the five pillars of Islam, but it's used as a form of extortion or protection racket by these groups, and it's also a way to kind of demonstrate legitimacy. Uh, population control, institution building, and the performance of public authority as various facets of insurgent social order uh, or governance. And I mean, just to demonstrate how much money, you know, Zakat collection uh, generates in Niger in January, uh, fighters uh, believed to be Islamic State of the Greater Sahara or ISGS, they you know, raided a, a couple of villages uh, between the regions of Tilaberi, uh, Tawa, and Doso, and they collected an amount equivalent nearly 12,000 euros. So that is a lot of money. And this was only within the course of a week. So, I mean, you can imagine if they managed to extract 12,000 euros in the course of a week in a few villages, in this part of Niger, then you can imagine what both Jenin and ISGS collect, you know, throughout these three countries most affected by the insurgency. So that, those are the two kind of main facets of the economy. Then you also have cattle trade, cattle rustling. I mean, the cattle trade is one of the main livelihoods, uh, you know, in the region beside agriculture so the market is region-wide it's uh, you know generates a lot of money uh, a lot of uh, turnover and so on so they also rustle a lot of cattle from villages and especially from communities that are considered either pro-state or pro-militia or simply non-compliant with their agenda so it's a form of you know, source of revenue, but also a, you know, means of intimidation or subjugation. So that is the third one. Then you also have artisanal mining. And I mean, this uh, came to prominence in 2014, 2015. Uh, when uh, members of uh, Katiba Khalid ibn al-Walid began operating in the border area between Mali, uh, Burkina Faso, and Ivory Coast. And it was also then it became more known that militant groups, they used artisanal mining sites for training and for obtaining, you know, these kind of basic ID components, including detonation cord, um, explosives and other things that could be used for IEDs and just generally, you know, to, to convene and extract and extract gold and also generate revenue. And, you know, artisanal mining sites really provide militants with the optimal kind of environment because 
it it enables them to be very versatile they can you know very swiftly shift from being combatants to civilians and i mean the artisanal mining trade in the region amounts to about two billion dollars a year and even though we don't know how much you know a group like jnm you know generate from from this uh, multi-billion uh, trade of gold i think it's fair to assume that they at least earn a fair amount of money uh, either to ta taxation of mining activities or commissioning but as i said it uh, has this multifaceted aspects you know for them to be involved and control these gold mining sites and as these groups have expanded a lot throughout the region, particularly in uh, Burkina Faso, but also in parts of Niger, in areas which harbor a lot of artisanal mining sites, I mean, it becomes a real issue that these groups control these uh, mining sites. And beyond these uh, first four components or key facets that I mentioned, I would add looting as another very important part of Jinin's war economy. And looting, it's in a way a, for, for a form of self-sustenance, uh, which uh, provide them with supplies. And often, you know, when people discuss Jinin, they think it's like this big, you know, corporate kind of militant organization, but it's also about, you know, a lot of simplicity they they use what they can get and there is a perfect example from burkina faso in the in the province of gnagna uh, where they you know regularly uh, loot uh, school canteens and it's it's so kind of widespread and concentrated to this spe specific province that you can see that it's really a form of granary of the group they use it as a support zone. They loot the school canteens for food stuff, just to kind of, you know, to sustain their operations in neighboring areas. So that's, you know, a kind of key function of this specific geographic area. And another thing is like, you know, the hijacking of fuel tanks. Jenim, they hijack a lot of fuel tankers, especially on the road between Jibo and Wagadougou. The preferred target is 14,000 liters uh, fuel tankers. And you can imagine, you know, how much those tankers provide them with fuel since they ride motorcycles that doesn't consume that much. So you can imagine that. Uh, and also, you know, the hijacking of NGO chartered uh, uh, trucks with supplies often intended for IDPs so I mean first they get what they themselves need but they can also divert this aid to select communities or their own kind of constituencies which you know both enable them to increase their support and to satisfy their own needs and so forth and lastly i would uh, move on to illicit trade so illicit trade is also another source of you know essential goods uh, more fuel motorcycle ammunition all other you know kind of goods that they you know would be in need of and it's and the illicit trade activities is also you know something that they can tax they can commission especially in areas and in the smuggle kind of bottlenecks that they control you know in border areas because most of the group's activities are very focused in border areas whether it's uh, you know bordering the littoral states or niger or between mali and burkina faso and so forth so i will stop it there and i kind of highlighted the, the main six key facets, I would say, of Jamin's war economy. Oh, absolutely. That was very exhaustive and very helpful.
okay how these uh, how do they generate income i mean it's through as you said livestock um, imposing zakat that religious uh, tax on livestock through and how they manage this artisanal gold mining uh, sites and all of this enabled them to purchase vital supplies such as food medicine weapons ammunition you know uh, motorcycles spare parts fuel communication equipment and then you added the other elements like the hijacking of fuel tankers the looting um so uh, uh that takes me that will take me to the second uh, question henny uh and this one particularly you know about women what what parts I mean, do women play in these economic endeavors that you outlined you know uh, articulated in uh, uh, previously and can you provide some specific examples here yeah, I mean, Rita, he touched upon it a little yeah. bit. And I think that, you know, the women's role is the most under-researched, uh, you know, when it comes to the insurgency in the South, women's uh, voices are rarely heard. And I mean, that also reflects the research about, you know, the women's role. Uh, what uh, I have, you know, learned to my research, at least, is that when it comes to women, groups like Jane, first and foremost, they want to kind of regulate, uh, you know, women's kind of participation in social and economic activities. So it's much about, you know, controlling, you know, women. And at the same time, they generally oppose that women participate in their activities, even though it happens to, you know, providing logistics, information. There are several examples, like for instance, during a massacre in Burkina Faso in the town of Solhan, it was said that some women, you know, took on the role as indicators. They showed the militants people to target and so on. And there are other, you know, research that show that you know, some female traders, they supply jihadi camps in the bush and so on. So there are, there are a few examples like providing intelligence and, you know, supplies and, you know, participating in, in other forms of activities. But I would say that, you know, women constitute a very important social base of these groups. So, I mean, they are mothers, sisters, wives, and, you know, they care for children and function in, you know, kind of in the core of, of, of the family. They, they are a social base of the group. And I mean, women, they also see the result of, of uh, the interplay between armed actors. I mean, you know, how military forces are abusive or that, you know, people are getting killed and they also have these feelings of vengeance maybe and so they also play their own kind of role in this ecosystem excellent very good i mean women indeed are used for various reasons i mean that evolve according to the group's needs and, and the context in which they 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 operate obviously uh so so women obviously play a major role in countering these groups but but in other contexts, they also can enable groups to obtain, as, as you said, and Reda as well, uh, finances and logistics necessary for their functioning. For example, the Katiba Messina, there was research published um, a few months ago by the ISS. You know, they have uh, uh, depicted how they use women to get food, medicine, and other necessities. Now, some women are involved in the supply chain for acquiring materials for operations such as fertilizer or making improvised explosive devices. Uh, they can also act as informants and, and scouts, obviously, uh, before, as, as you said, in uh, uh, military uh, operations in, in this case. Uh, so I'll go to, uh, to Ambassador Kamisa. And, and before I do, please you make sure you submit your questions in the chat. Don't wait till, uh, till, uh, till we're done. Uh, with the with, with with ambassador, so you can submit questions in the chat line at any time during the presentation. And again, we're keeping track of those, and we'll make sure we'll ask them and uh, try to answer them to to uh, to the best uh, we can. Uh, so, uh, ambassador, the the you know what we have seen in 
in the last year and, and arguably way before that the public has become dissatisfied with you know the approach approaches to dealing with insurgents certainly with the purely military approach to dealing with the insurgents and 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 certainly the the present approach is is clearly not not working i mean there is no doubt that uh, that the state and its international partners have inflicted losses on on, on this group GNIM, uh, but they have failed to, you know, to neutralize the the group. They have failed to secure zones that they have even retaken from from the militants here. And GNIM has its own problems as well. It has to contend with a variety of diverse armed groups that are fighting it, that are seeking to dislodge it from its stronghold. So. Uh, there are also sharp intercommunal tensions. So as this violent surge, or as Reda depicted it as this ethnic violent surge, even if ethnicity is not obviously the driver of violent extremism, uh, it's been politicized, but, but these protagonists, I mean, the state and GNI and others, they have started to tacitly, you know, explore alternative ways. And, and one of them is, you know, talk. So is dialogue a viable option, for example, in, in this case? So my question to you, Ambassador, uh, is, is there a place for GJNIM uh, or, or GNIM in the political landscape of the countries where it operates? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Anwar, and thank you to the panelists who are very familiar faces. Um, uh, to all of us who are, have been observing these uh, violent extremist organizations in, in the Sahel. So thank you for having me um, as part of this important discussion. So to answer your question, I would say that there has to be a place for some uh, militants in the political landscape of the countries where it operates in order to put an end to uh, what can be considered a protracted conflict with no end in sight, a conflict that has um, obviously reached an impasse. And so, and you've mentioned it in, in passing, for Jnim to have a place in, in, the, in, in Mali's or Niger or Burkina Faso's political landscapes, there has to be some, so, some form of, of dialogue that, that would then need to lead to negotiations with governments and which negotiations would then lead to agreements. And so the question of dialogue with terrorist groups has been a thorny one because there has never been a solid agreement as to why would we uh, conduct a dialogue with um, a terrorists who have blood on their hands and who kill our own. Or if we were to have a dialogue with them, how would that dialogue or those negotiations be conducted? Um, and if we were to have a dialogue, who should we target exactly? Who are the individuals who are um, responsible for, for the group, uh, who are representative of the group, who would have a voice within the group and who can speak on behalf of the group. And then finally, to what end would we have um, this dialogue? Or can we even negotiate with, with terrorists? And these have been questions that have been um, coming um, uh, quite often in, in, the, in the, uh, the topic of uh, terrorist groups and their operations and whether governments are strong enough to, to combat them. And so one important aspect to consider in the case of, of Jnim is that although its members who have the blood on their hands are deemed not fit for dialogue or negotiations with the central state, most, most recruits are local. Um, and we tend to forget, but Yara Rali is, is a Malian. He, not too long ago, he um, held, he was a diplomat and served Mali as a Malian diplomat in Saudi Arabia. And so because most of the recruits are a local, this might imply that those recruits are in some form of, form of revolt against a state that has lost its legitimacy through you know, either the lack of delivery of, of basic services, uh, pervasive corruption, um, uh, and, uh, you know, preference or um, uh, neglect of some, some uh, groups uh, within, within their, their own countries. And so I would imagine that, that those um, who are members of those, those terrorist groups are 
more in a, again, a, um, a war against the central state than an ideological war. And so when they take part in, in terrorist attacks against their own, um, we have to understand in that case that we're not necessarily always dealing with terrorists with very hard, hardline uh, ideological um, uh, ideas or um, convictions, but we're dealing more with insurgents. And so with insurgents, we can certainly deal uh, with both militarily and politically. And so in, in Mali, for example, while the conflict with jihadists has spread widely from the north of the country to the center since 2012, and it's now making its way towards the southern part of the country, public opinion increasingly believes that the war cannot be won by, by weapons and, and arms and that the dialogue is necessary. And likewise, in, in neighboring Burkina Faso, where the terrorist threat rages, um, the pre-coup national authorities visibly wanted to put an end to um, what could be called an overly militaristic solution that didn't really bear fruit. And so, and that's my personal opinion, and I'm sure that there, there will be many questions um, around this, uh, this topic of, you know, a dialogue, dialogue with terrorists, you know, should we or should we not have this dialogue? The central governments of Mali and Burkina Faso should definitely engage JNIM, but only in select predefined situations where the benefits of establishing lines of communication outweigh the costs of legitimizing violence and alienating nonviolent opposition groups within the country. Thank you, Ambassador. Yeah, I mean, definitely the views on, on dialogue, obviously, they, they, they diverge. I mean, uh, uh, public support for talks, is, as you know, and as you stated, has clearly uh, increased. Uh, uh, but there are obviously those that oppose it. There are many politicians, civil society organizations, religious leaders that harbor deep reservations. You know, <clears throat> some doubt that the leadership of, of Jinim is, is willing to compromise. You know, even Biku, uh, the pioneer of the pro dialogue discourse, he questions whether Lahali or Kufa will ever accept a political settlement. But again, what's the alternative uh, out there? So it was interesting that you have singled out T J uh, and I M or, or Jinim, but but not not other groups and, and how you talked about the fighters and <clears throat> some of them obviously don't join for ideological reasons. Most are, are local, but there have to be clear goals uh, when you and if you uh, 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 engage here, because talks would be a leap into the unknown. But as you stated, that <clears throat> might be uh, something uh, worthy of, of consideration, given that there is or there has not been a military solution to, to this uh, to this conflict. Uh, so thank you for engaging with that, uh, Ambassador. Uh, and that takes me to the last question for you, Ambassador, is, uh, you know, what are the, the lessons learned from a decade-long counterterrorism strategy and approach, you know, fighting groups such as uh, Jinim? Or G J N I M, mm -hmm. and and how can we use you know these lessons that we have learned to redesign better responses or new responses? Thank you. So I think you said it. Rita has said it, and I, I think I've heard Henny say it also. I think we all agree that the military solution only has showed its limit, and so. The search for an alternative way forward is a question of survival for, for uh, countries of the Sahel. Um, the Shinim coalition itself has sought to impose an ultra-conservative interpretation of Islam on both mm. state and, and society, and it continues to claim thousands of lives um, through uh, attacks uh, both against <clears throat> civilians and uh, national militaries. But obviously, civilians of the region are hit uh, the hardest and there is a, a number that I remember reading, and it was quite shocking. Um, mm. Something like the the number or the the, the number of casualties uh, since 2016 rose to um, like 1,800 percent since 2016, and that's that's a shocking number. And so. To me, the, the creation of, of the G5 Sahel Coalition and its joint force uh, in 2016, uh, which is really a homegrown initiative that was set up to combat terrorism on a regional level, has definitely helped 
uh, ramp up efforts and solidify <clears throat> gains in the fight uh, against terrorism. And so uh, it, it's clear because it's clear that the war on terror in the region cannot be won in the short to, to medium terms. There might be uh, some, some options or opportunities when it comes to, to the GFAC Sahel. Um, unfortunately, foreign backed wars against our in the region have more often resulted in civil casualties, uh, pervasive human rights violation and abuse, some widespread corruption. Human Rights Watch has documented the unlawful killings uh, perpetrated by uh, anti-terrorism or counter-terrorism operations in in the region, and so you know, hearing uh, you know what uh, Rida said, and I'm, I'm building on on what he mentioned uh, when it comes to the question of of state legitimacy. Countries of the region might have uh, created an environment where those terrorist groups uh, were able to to flourish. Um, I remember when I was uh, working in the Malian government, I, I worked with some MPs from the northern regions of Mali who uh, came to me and were like, you know, the, the solution to this um, uh, threat that we're facing is quite obvious and easy, but it sounds and seems like the central government doesn't really understand that, for example, for um, people in remote regions to feel part of the country, all you need, for example, is to bring national TV to northern and remote parts of the region, which is not the case. Or um, another grievance was, well, we, you appoint governors in, in, in some of those remote regions and they're remote for people who live in the capital city, but they're, they're not mm -hmm. remote for people who live in Kidal or, or Gao or elsewhere. So you appoint these governors, but we don't see them. We never see them. We don't even know what they look like. Uh, same when it comes to uh, local elected officials. And so the state has to be there. The state has to be present, not only by name, uh, but it has to, you know, uh, besides uh, providing uh, basic services, national TV is one, one um, uh, instrument that is actually, I shouldn't even call it an instrument. It has to be, uh, uh, a sign of state sovereignty in some of those of, the, yeah. of those regions, and so the role of the state um, has longer term and will have larger impacts in fighting those terrorist groups, and um, and some of those uh, uh, tools that the state can use are low hanging fruits, um, and but they have to be intentional, especially in those in those. Uh, uh, remote regions of, of the countries. And so maybe quickly to allow for us to, to answer some of the very interesting questions that the, the participants have, um, I believe that for obvious reasons, localized conflicts and terrorist threats, and I'm, I'm considering Shnim in Burkina, Mali, and Niger as localized terrorist threats, uh, they're better tackled by national and regional entities. And so I'm thinking national militaries, I'm thinking G5 Sahel, I'm thinking joint force, even though we have to acknowledge that international assistance has been essential in the region. Continuing a policy that's overly focused on militarized counterterrorism won't cut it. Working with the G5 Sahel, strengthening its counterterrorism capabilities and intelligence capabilities, and potentially provide counsel to the coalition from lessons learned uh, in Afghanistan, Lebanon, and elsewhere would certainly be a step in the right direction. And also working with the state to make sure that its services are also felt in some of those regions could really have some uh, long-term impact in fighting the terrorist groups. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you, uh, thank you Ambassador. I mean, definitely uh, there is a need for states and. And, and the regional actors and international community as well to reorient their approach to one that prioritizes, you know, better governance, to one that strives to attenuate, you know, these escalating tensions that we have seen among communities and between communities and the state, especially in the rural areas, uh, which these groups, uh, you know, exploit. Uh, as you said, Ambassador, the states uh, and their uh, um, and their partners, they have to redouble. Uh, efforts to improve government's delivery of basic services 
uh, to citizens. There has also to be a push, as Reda said, and, and Hini, you know, and yourself, about to improve the behavior of, uh, you know, of, uh, of, of, of governments in, in, in this case. Um, so this this brings a, 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 an end to this first part of, of our session. Uh, we still have 15 minutes, and we'll devote them to the to the Q and A. So um, if you have not submitted your question into the chat, <coughs> please do so. Uh, and uh, several have done uh, so already, and my colleagues have organized them here for me. Uh, some are in French, and, and others are, 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 are in English. So uh, let's start with uh, this uh, uh, three questions in in French. So the first one expresses frustration, really. I mean, au uh, regard des études assez pointues faites par des In terms of the studies of the uh, organizations to fight these organizations, to not find the causes and the roots of these uh, problems. Why can we not find the solutions to this problem? Second question to the ambassador. Vu votre expérience d'ancien membre de gouvernement du Mali. Considering your experience in the government of Mali, what explains the rise in power of these groups in Mali in spite of the efforts of of all to fight this in the indicators uh, show that the number of people killed has risen what can we do to stabilize this situation and what are the alternatives for the governments in case côté négociation in case the g Let's, I think, SIM would refuse any negotiation to the to the ambassador, but, but really to, uh, to to all. Let me add this because it fits as well. How can this is for Reda and, and, and to all really? How can states and governments meet, you know, these groups midway? And what practical steps would you suggest governments should take in in that in that regard? So I'll start with the ambassador. Then go to uh, to uh, to Reda and 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 Hini. We can address uh, uh, these questions or what we want, whatever fits. Merci. Donc je vais répondre en français par rapport Thank à. Thank you. I will uh, answer question, in French. In terms of the uh, question, there were two questions. The first one was in terms of the existing alternatives. I think that to these questions, I think that we are dealing with terrorist groups who have very sophisticated strategies. And these strategies sometimes are more simple in a way than those used by the armies that are fighting them. But when we speak of alternatives, we must also look at the elements that my colleague and you mentioned earlier in terms of the financial aspects that underlie all of the terrorist attacks that we have seen and the continuous uh, environment of kidnappings of extortion that these terrorists are are using in the regions when we speak of alternatives we must also realize that the elements of these terrorist groups when they are operating, they have the prestige, they have the money, they have the power. And so when the government seek to negotiate with them, they must be able to offer them the same things, power, prestige, and money. And I am not certain that these governments, what kind of offer the governments can, can make, but in terms of their reintegration, their reinsertion in, in uh, in the, the the management of the state of giving them a role in the state i think our countries need to really work much harder to try to uh, in terms of their legitimacy when uh, and also in vis-a-vis -vis the populations the legitimacy um, of the terrorist groups that uh, that that it just becomes much more complicated to negotiate in these in this environment in terms 
In terms of the increase of the number of attacks, what can be done to weaken these terrorist groups? There really is not a magical, magical or magical solution to uh, to make these groups disappear. Uh, there are um, military who fight these terrorist groups. The military has been fighting them for 10 years, so they do have some experience on the ground, which is not negligible. Uh, but the attacks, the terrorist attacks, must not make us believe that the soldiers, the military that are confronting them are weak and do not know what they are dealing with. We must realize, uh, we must understand that this is a long-term war and we have to see within this long term, Civil, what is the role that uh, civil society can play to work uh, to fight back these terrorist attacks? Because a strictly military solution will not provide the answer. Excellent. Uh, okay, Areda, please. Yeah, I will. I will talk about the. Uh, I'll answer the question about how states, uh, governments can meet uh, extremist groups halfway, and and then it falls in the, uh, on the dialogue issue and negotiations with with jihadists. Uh, I think first of all, state leaders have to to hold high standards. First of all, by the the the, the political will, and also accept that there is a problem, and there are problems that allowing. VEOs and extremists to exist on their, on their territory. So I think that we need that political will at the leadership. Second, dialogue, accepting to have that dialogue between all the actors concerned. This involves, of course, the state, population, and the, the, the jihadist groups. Everyone has to be uh, on the table uh, concerned, and everyone concerned have, needs to be on the table, and how to convince them is to focus on the positives. I mean, look at the situation right now. Look at, everyone is losing. Uh, the, the, the population is losing, the state is losing, uh, jihadist groups are, are losing because they don't have any clear objectives, et cetera. So I think focusing on the positives, I think that's, that, that's how we could move forward. Third, I think also the international community has a role to play here by not doing anything, just providing support and stepping back and letting national governments of the region to handle uh, their, their domestic issues and give them that freedom of deciding what's best for, for, for them. Um, fourth, I think we, for those, as, as uh, Ambassador mentioned, like, do, those who do, do not accept and how to address some of the, the issues to of, of security issues for the state to return. And that's what we have been saying. There is counterterrorism efforts, yet there is no like what's next. So I think we need to start thinking. I think not, states in the region, along with the international community, think of when we liberate some, some areas or this, the, eliminate jihadist groups from certain areas. So then do we have a plan and a strategy for the state to return so that the local population and community can, can feel normal again and can return to live normal? And so, the, so that the environment doesn't allow jihadist groups to return because we have seen a lot of like, they, they leave and come back because there is no strategy of afterwards. So I think just four points and when it comes to, to, uh, to that question about state's uh, role. Excellent. Thank you, Rida. Penny, do you want do you have anything to add here? Yeah, I mean, more in general, I, I would point to the aspect of justice. I mean, when you look at all the actions uh, carried out, whether it's jihadi groups, local militias, or government forces, there is this clear absence of justice. So I think that is something that needs to be addressed primarily alongside governance issues. I mean, whether it's uh, in Jirgu in Burkina Faso or what's currently happening in Mora or, I mean, we don't know for sure. We don't have all the elements what took place there, but I mean, 
all eyes are currently on Mora in, in, in Mali. But I mean, these are just two cases of hundreds. So I mean, all armed actors involved, they have perpetrated, you know, atrocities, and that is something that really needs to be addressed. But at the same time, I also think that is a important aspect when engaging these groups in, in dialogue. I think that is like a, a point of entrance, you know, to address or to raise questions or, you know, negotiate around governance issues and, and justice. And in a way that could open, you know, up for, for other matters you know, to negotiate. But I mean, as I saw some of in the audience ask, why if these groups don't want to negotiate? Why, why if they, you know, refuse? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a really tricky balance. And, but still, I mean, you need to kind of seize the opportunities. Currently there are, and then there is this an initiative in Burkina Faso with this local, committees that has been announced by, you know, the Burkina the transition government. So, I mean, let's hope and see what they will yield. And, and that, is, that is at least a good initiative and a good start. Absolutely. Um, okay, well, let's do another round of, of questions and have a few, few minutes here. Um, some are specific, some are, are more uh, general. So one question is, uh, about the steps that regional blocs are taking to ensure that these violent extremist groups uh, do not have strong links with each other, as this is a way of, of spreading their operations of, in several countries like uh, uh, Janine has, has done. Uh, this one is specifically to the ambassador, though we have addressed it uh, generally, but they're asking if you're asked to advise the Malian government on how to solve the terrorist situation in Mali, what will be your your, your advice uh, for for Reda? They're asking you for your perspective on the difference between uh, uh, Jinem and the High Council for Unity of Azawa, by extension, the CMA, the Coordination Azawa Movement. Do you think that those who gave the, they say they have a national floor to those groups are also responsible for the current situation? Uh, particular question is, again, it has been addressed, is the overemphasis on, on, on the military, you know, uh, side of the equation that on the development uh, one that's coming from, from Mauritania. Um, this one is in French, compte tenu de la nouvelle donnée politique au Mali. In terms of the current situation in Mali, can we fear uh, rapprochement of the jihadist groups and what is the fundamental difference between the uh, the GSIM and the Islamic states in the greater Sahel. What explains these violent, periodical violence uh, uh, encounters between the different jihadist groups? And questions they want to, to, if you can provide more information here about the terrorist threat in, in uh, uh, in, in Ghana. So I'll start with, with you, Reda, if that's okay, and then go to Henny and end up with uh, Ambassador Kinesh. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll address the two questions, the difference between Jinem and the HCR and the uh, Northern Ghana issue. Um, the difference, uh, HCR, as we know, is the, it, it's an offshoot of uh, secular armed groups that initiated the, the 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 rebellion in 2012 that transformed initially it, it, it had it has different names and then transformed to to HCR now and it's it's a more of a secular group has political demands um, unlike JNM which is more of an, an extremist group which targets the security money and security forces international forces um, so the, the the political demands are different. So th there is a difference between the two groups. Um, one is jihadists and one is more political demands that and um, which has been happening for decades. Um, so it, it, the, the name might be different, but the demands are remain the same. Um, and it's just a transformation of the, uh, the Tuareg rebellion that started in the 60s. Um, 
the uh, the question about northern Ghana, uh, I don't have the magic ball, you know, the, the capsule to 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 see what's happening in northern Ghana, but I'm I'm making that assessment based on my experience, like seeing how things evolved in the Sahel and how it also evolved in into Burkina Faso. And we have seen attacks in Northern Benin. We have seen attacks in Northern Côte d'Ivoire. And it doesn't mean if the situation is still quiet right now in Northern Ghana, it doesn't mean that nothing is happening. I think that's, where it, that's, that's when it's worrying, when nothing is happening and we tend to be content of, of the situation and we think everything is fine. But that usually it's, it, it's not the case. So the rumors are that GNM is already building networks in, in, in this area. So uh, is it confirmed? I don't know. I, I don't have the, the exact information to confirm that, but it will be naive not to take it seriously because, because of what has happened in other countries in the region. Uh, I, I have said the same thing about Telaberi and Tawa region back in 2012, 2013 when nothing was happening in Telaberi region and everyone was focusing on DFA and around the Lake Chad. And then years later, and we know the history, we know now what's happening in Telaberi region of Niger. We know what's happening in the Sahel region of Burkina Faso and Northern Burkina Faso. We know what's happening in Northern Cote d'Ivoire. So I, I think it, it, it will be, it, 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 something is happening. I don't have the, the, the facts, but um, I will be, I will, I will be, um, I would be cautious of, of what's happening in northern, northern Ghana right now. Even if there are no attacks, I think we have to be cautious. Okay, all right, thank you. Kenny? Yeah, I can address the, the Ghana question okay. because it's quite inter interesting as well. Uh, you, you know, I, I think northern Ghana hosts the same kind of vulnerabilities as northern Benin and northern Cote d'Ivoire and even Togo. So even if there hasn't been any act of violence, or at least not documented, I think there is quite well known that these groups have used these northernmost areas as rare bases uh, in recent years, and also the proximity to parts of uh, Burkina Faso, which is affected by jihadist violence. And this kind of, you could say, strategic calculus could change very fast. I mean, if something that some action that strictly kind of inhibits what these groups try to do or like related to illicit trade like preventing you know the free flow of, of goods in areas where they operate and have the need for certain you know items or, or whatever or yes targeting their networks by carrying out the rest then that could trigger violence. I mean, that is something that we already seen in Northern Benin. And also there was this, you know, initial attack in Togo, which seems to have some links to, you know, illicit trade networks in, in that area. And I mean, that's kind of points to the risk of what can happen in Northern Ghana. And I mean, there are information that points to that both JNIM and ISGS has a presence in, in those areas. All right, thank you. And we will end up with the ambassador. Thank you, very difficult question that I am asked uh, about how to advise the Malian government as to how to put an end to uh, the terror. And I wish I had a magic wand and I could uh, you know, give a, an advice that would be applicable to Niger and Burkina as well. But um, one quick quick win to me would be, uh, and I, I don't really have the, the economic elements to even make that, that um, calculus, but it's an assumption that I'm making. So Mali spends about 30% of its annual budget uh, on defense. Um, and that's done to, the uh, expense of, at the expense of education and health and other uh, basic services. So what I would do for maybe the next three years would be to invite the Malian government to maybe use 10% of that defense budget and um, defer it to education and health and make sure that um, there is telephone and TV coverage 
in the northern and central part of the parts of the country. I was a minister of digital economy at some point, and it was really hard uh, for me to find funding in order to um, make sure that the, the country had telephone coverage. And I think uh, when it comes to TV, telephone coverage goes hand in hand, um, and it would make a huge difference in how the state um, communicates with um, its its citizens. And maybe, maybe that's an assumption. Uh, terrorist groups would have less uh, ground. Okay. Well, thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Reda and 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 Henny. Um, I think we had a good uh, uh, conversation uh, today. Uh, and again, one of the most important lessons uh, gleaned is that uh, we have heard this over and over again: is that military operations alone cannot stop the spread of. Of violent extremism. That's why everybody's disappointed today with the results of this military heavy approach pursued, uh, you know, by states and 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 other partners. So the the the, the stabilization strategies uh, that have been undertaken, you know, by states and and their international partners, and whose goal was to stabilize, you know, Mali and. Sahel uh, more broadly with investments in security development and governance, unfortunately has uh, foundered, um, you know, and certainly it has foundered amid the rise of uh, in communal killings and, and, and violent extremism, as well as the eroding of the confidence, you know, in the region's uh, government. So there is a necessity to reorient that approach, as I said earlier, as the speakers, the panelists have stated to prioritize, you know, uh, governance, improve the behavior of governance, because insecurity and violent extremism, they thrive on the failures of governance, including in the security sector, because the security sector in several of these fragile countries of the Sahel, they feel beleaguered by manpower shortages, by poor training, by lack of adequate equipment. But the general consensus is that strengthening security institutions require uh, more than just training, require more than just equipping uh, these armed forces and other security providers. We need effective management and accountability of the security sector. It's just as Rita said, it is just as crucial for the provision of security and the creation of an environment that is conducive to uh, you know, socioeconomic uh, growth. So, uh, and finally, it's impossible, we have heard this from the three of, of you, uh, to tackle the problem of of uh, Jinan and other violent extremist groups in uh, in the Sahel, especially the peripheral areas of the Sahel, without governments filling the major gaps in security and service provision. It is to better compete with these groups and government should step up efforts to A, protect communities, and then to address you know, the debilitating shortages in food, and water, and uh, and, uh, and in healthcare, as the ambassador and, and other stated. So we will continue this conversation. We will have more webinars, you know, uh, one uh, coming up on the so called Islamic State in the Great Year Sahara, and then we move to the Lake Chad Basin, and, and again go to, uh, you know, northern uh, uh, to East Africa and, 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 uh, and, other, and other theaters. But uh, uh, I wish if the audience can join me to thank all of you, but you have uh, read in the comments uh, uh, how, uh, you know, pleased and uh, by uh, and, and satisfied, you know, with, uh, with uh, you sharing your, your expertise uh, with us. So again, thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, I have learned uh, quite a lot and I'm sure the audience have done uh, as well. So we'll continue this discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, stay safe and well. And again, uh, Ramadan Karim to those who are observing Ramadan. Stay safe. <laughs>